what is the air that we breathe actually made of? Besides gas molecules, air contains tiny solid and liquid particles that are called aerosol particles. A cubic centimeter of ambient air contains about 10 to the 19 gas molecules and roughly 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 aerosol particles. So why are aerosol scientists like us interested in such a tiny fraction of particles? In fact, aerosols produce powerful effects. Aerosol particles affect our health and impact visibility, and they scatter sunlight. A lot of solar energy gets lost on its way to the Earth's surface due to aerosol particles. In order to scatter, particles need to have the right size. In the atmosphere, we deal with particle sizes between one nanometer and a tenth of a millimeter. But what controls the size of a particle? Well, this depends on the way it is produced and modified in the gas. We call this aerosol dynamics. In the atmosphere, aerosols can be produced from direct emission processes such as combustion. These particles are typically rather big, in the size range of microns. What we are primarily interested in is the particle production process from the phase transition of vapors. These particles start growing from single molecules at sizes close to one nanometer. It is a highly dynamic formation mechanism that involves nucleation, condensation, evaporation, and coagulation. Let me translate this. Imagine you are a water molecule in air. You will be hit frequently by nitrogen and oxygen molecules that make up 99% of air. They are reluctant to stick, so they will bounce off again quickly. On very rare occasions, let's say one in a thousand collisions, you will be hit by another water molecule. The specific properties of water allow you, under appropriate conditions, to stick together. So, you have formed a bimolecular cluster. Further addition of water molecules allows your cluster to grow. Sounds simple. But what controls the formation of these clusters? At the very beginning, when the cluster consists of only a few molecules, it has a strongly curved surface, which cannot hold the molecules very well. So every molecule has a significant likelihood to re-vaporize, and the cluster will usually decay again. If, however, the cluster grows by statistical fluctuations to larger sizes, the surface curvature will decrease and allow the arriving molecules to stick more easily. Once the cluster has reached a critical size, it grows easily to larger sizes. Thereby, a phase transition takes place, transforming gas molecules into a new particle. But things are not that straightforward. There is another problem related to these small nanoparticles. Newborns tend to explore the world and spread out quickly. They hit whatever comes across their path. If the object they hit is another condensable molecule, the nanoparticle will try to hold it so it gains size and importance. If it hits a comparatively large object, such as a dust particle, it is the end of the nanoparticle. It sticks immediately upon collision and is removed from the gas. So the survival probability for a newly formed nanoparticle to become relevant for macroscopic effects depends largely on the background contamination and how fast it grows. So what is our contribution to this field? We are using experimental techniques to identify potential pathways of particle formation from various vapors. Usually we do this under precisely controlled laboratory conditions so we can eliminate contamination effects. For our experiments, we need a source of vapor and a measurement chamber. There we can manipulate the conditions so that the vapor prefers to transit to the condensed phase. We call it a supersaturated vapor. Supersaturation can be achieved by chemical reaction or simply a quick temperature drop in the chamber. The degree of supersaturation determines how efficiently the particle formation takes place. We then illuminate the particles by a laser and measure the scattered light. Thereby, we can determine how many particles form as a function of supersaturation. Isn't that fascinating? You start from pure gas only and end up with a cloud of particles that you can see. In our laboratory, we can also add defined nanoparticles to the gas. Thereby, we can study under which conditions the cloud formation is facilitated. Now you may be wondering, what is it all good for? The formation of nanoparticles also occurs frequently in the air that surrounds you. Once these newly formed particles have grown large enough, they will scatter light and affect cloud properties. So the phase transition can impact global climate. At the same time, we can use the method of particle formation to characterize air quality. When we expose particles to a moderately supersaturated vapor, 
the vapor will condense on the particles and grow them to sizes where they can be detected by light scattering. Our research on particle formation thus constitutes a vital link between phase changes on the microscopic scale and macroscopic effects in the global atmosphere.